What's that? Okay. It's time for us to, to begin our uh, our next lecture. Before we do, I have an announcement that we need to make. Uh, J.D. Conley was uh, taken to the emergency room last night, and uh, he is back home now. But we want to keep him in our prayers as as we uh, as he's going having some trouble. So. Um, we, we will be led in song by uh, Tim Wells, and then we will have a prayer by Hunter Williams, and I'll come and introduce Andy here shortly. Thank you. This song's on the overhead. It's not in the book, so... God reigns over the nations. God says... control from on high. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Our God, the most high God, doth rule in the kingdom of men. The proud he collapses, the lowly saves, submission of our in demands. The nations who willingly humble themselves will be the dominions that stand. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Our God, the most high God, doth rule in the kingdom of men. The stone from a mountain cut out with this kingdom will never be conquered. Against its house gate shall never prevail. Its son will be left to no other. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Our God, the most high God, doth rule in the kingdom of men. The throne sits on high in the depths of men's hearts, won over by willing surrender. A warfare with weapons to carnal affair, no tyrant our king but our father. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for this amazing blessing. This amazing blessing that you have, you have bestowed upon us to, to come together, to come together to hear your word presented in, and in such a wonderful manner, Lord. We thank you for the speakers and the, and the time that they set aside of their busy lives to, to study and prepare and to deliver your word and to deliver uh, the wonderful book of Psalms, your word, Lord, to us, your children of God, to, to hear your word and to hopefully allow it to, to prick our hearts and, and to do its job and to, to affect us and to make us better Christians, Lord. We thank you for, for all the things you give us each and every day, every opportunity you give us to, to hear your word, to study your word, and to Hopefully be your word as, as, as best as possible, Lord. We thank you for, for the eldership here, Lord. The eldership that, that allows us to, to, to be here and allows us to, to have the opportunities we have here, Lord. We thank you for all the, the physical blessings you give us in our lives, allowing us to prosper, 
so that we may better benefit you and your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for all the friends and family you give us in our lives and, and how necessary they are to our faith and how you allow them to encourage us to continue to fight the good fight, Lord. We ask you to please use us, Lord, your children, your tools of your word, Lord, in any way you, you are willing to use us, Lord, so that we may better benefit man, better benefit your kingdom, and better benefit your word, Lord. We ask you to, to please guide us, to please hold our hand along our long and, and hard walk as a Christian, Lord. We ask you to please tighten around our hands so we may feel your presence, so we may know you're there, so we may not give up, Lord, so we may continue strong, so we may continue to, to strive and to desire and to love you and your word, Lord, and fight for you, Lord. We ask you to please be with those all across the world that have yet to hear your word, that have yet to accept your word, Lord. And please, if, if it is your will, Lord, please heal up the, those that are physically sick so that they may come back to worship with us, so they may come back to worship wherever, wherever it is that they are, Lord. We thank you again for this congregation and this opportunity you give us here at the lectures to study your book of Psalms, Lord, this wonderful book of your word, Lord. We ask you to please be with us and guide us every single day, Lord. Please forgive us for our many sins, for we fall often. We come to you in your precious and holy Son's name. Amen. Andy Robinson will be uh, presenting a lesson from Psalm 47. Andy, uh, most of us know, uh, I'm not going to go through his bio, but in fact, uh, Andy is probably the most humble man I know. Uh, I told him, that he said, don't, don't go read my whole bio. And I said, I didn't plan to at all. And he said, please read my bio. <laughs> <laughs> most of you know Andy. Most of you know how Andy is uh, let me give you a perspective from a student that comes to the school. Andy has helped me especially, and I'm sure he has all the other guys as well. I probably called him 20, 30 times before I even came. And he has helped me all along the way as a student here. He, he is very good with the guys, encouraging them, building them up, but yet holding uh, a standard that we should all set. We're so blessed to have Andy as the director of the school and the preacher here at Hillview Terrace. And we look forward to him bringing us a lesson this morning. I appreciate that very much, Steve. I appreciate all of you very much and love you. It's good to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. My wife cannot be here at this hour because she is taking my mother-in-law to the airport. This is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Actually, I stole that from my mother-in-law. We joke a lot. I love her very much, and we joke back and forth about that. She came downstairs this morning and said, this is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> Maybe she feels the same way. I don't know. <laughs> Hope that wasn't blasphemous to use a verse of Scripture like that. It is the day that the Lord has made. We love all these days. We love the chance to breathe and walk upon this earth and love and serve our God. We love the chance to study together and be with brethren in a week like this and fellowship. If there's one regret I have about a week like this, it's that it goes too quickly and I don't get to visit with people as much as I might like. But we love you and appreciate you very much. In 2 Chronicles 20, the people of Moab and Ammon and Mount Seir, or Edom, had gathered together against the people of Judah. Jehoshaphat was the king. He did something I've never seen a ruler do yet. He feared the Lord, set himself to seek the Lord, and called a fast throughout all of Judah. The people came to 
be at the temple and be at Jerusalem when this fast was going on and when Jehoshaphat called them. Jehoshaphat led them then in calling upon God. He said, among other things, in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 6 and 7, I believe, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? It's, you, know how, you know how you might talk to a child sometime and say, don't you know better than that? Don't, aren't you my child? Remember your name? Well, it's almost like he's talking to God like that, except with respect and awe, rather than, rather than looking down at a child, he's looking up at his God. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And is not there not in your hand power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? And are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land from before Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Then he goes on to ask God to do something about this particular situation. In verse 12, he says, O oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power at all against this great multitude that has come against us. Nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. After he concludes his prayer, Jehaziel the prophet stands up and starts to give a message to the children of Judah. Among those things that he said were these, You shall not be afraid or dismayed by this great multitude that has come against you, for the battle is not yours but God's. Echoing 1 Samuel 17, 47, when David speaks of the Philistines and says to them, You're going to know, this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, but the battle is the Lord's and He will give it into our hands. And then Jehaziel says a little bit later, You will not need to fight in this battle. Go, position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. The people of Judah then fall down to worship. I can't imagine the scene. Can you imagine maybe one of the great million man rallies in Washington, D.C., where everybody falls to his face to worship and call on the God of heaven? Everybody in Judah bows down. Up from those who are bowing down stand the Korahites and the Kohathites. Levi had a son named Kohath. Kohath had a son named Izhar. Izhar had a son named Korah. These became the leaders of music and praise in the house of God. These gentlemen stood up and started to praise the Lord with voices loud and high. When that scene was done, everybody moved out to where the battle was to take place, that they were just supposed to stand still and watch. And on the way, apparently, Jehoshaphat consulted with the people and set people to sing to the Lord and praise the beauty of holiness and pr say, praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. Now, as they began to sing... The Lord set ambushes against the people of Moab and Ammon, and they started to kill the people of Mount Seir. And after they got done killing the Edomites, they killed each other. And when the Israelites looked out, maybe in the midst of their song, maybe at the end of the song, I forget the text, or even if it says, all the people were dead. And all they had to do was go collect the spoils. That is the incident that many people believe are behind Psalm, is behind Psalm 47. Where verse 8 says, God reigns over the nations, God sits on His holy throne. Where verses 5 and 6 say, sing praises to our God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. Many people think that this is the incident behind that psalm. There's some dispute about it. A couple people on Monday said that this Second Chronicles chapter 20 incident is the incident behind the psalms that they were preaching. Well, they're wrong and I'm right. No, they... they when something of this magnitude happens, don't you think there might be more than one song written about it? September 11th, 2001 came, and there were probably hundreds of songs written, just a few published, but hundreds of songs written about that event. And maybe, just maybe, this is the event. There are some other clues that might lead us to that as we study through the text of Psalm 47. The title says, To the Chief Musician. Probably this means, because this is... Collect, this is connected to about 53 psalms and also at the end of the book of Habakkuk. This poem was written to the chief musician. When the chief musician would get a song, he would direct it, I suppose. It would be like giving a piece of music to a conductor and asking him to direct it. 
When someone writes a piece of music, he puts the notation exactly where he wants. Well, in former days, we didn't have quite the exact notation that we have now. We might have something called the figured bass, where a bass note was given, and the harpsichordist or the conductor or, or the improvisationalists were supposed to improvise above that figured bass. But now we have so many things that are set in exact notation in our music, and we even have the uh, dynamic symbols in those Italian markings on Dante and Allegro and Pianissimo and Retardando, speaking about Mark Weaver and all these other things there. I'm kidding, Mark. A little joke. And uh, we have all the and the, we have the symbols, the crescendo and the decrescendo. But still, when a chief musician, when a conductor gets hold of a piece of music, there's still some interpretation of how that music is going to sound that is just left up to the director. I think that's what it means when it says we're leaving, we're entrusting this, we're entrusting this to you for your direction as it is performed in worship. It is a psalm of the sons of Korah. It is one of the psalms of the sons of Korah. Many in the book of Psalms are that. And many people believe that since the Korahites are specifically mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 as standing up and praising the God of heaven with voices loud and high. And since these other attributes line up to this incident, that maybe this was the particular incident that inspired this psalm. These were the musicians. These were the ones over the house of music. It may mean that it was dedicated to the, song, the sons of Korah. It may mean that someone wrote the tune or wrote the words and they arranged the music to it. It may mean that they had some sense of direction over it or it may mean that they authored it. We just don't know for sure. I'm told that the Hebrew could mean for the sons of Korah, to the sons of Korah or of the sons of Korah and so we just don't know. But that part doesn't matter anyway. What matters is what we get in these magnificent nine verses. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, it says in verse 1. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. The word clap there, I'm told by Hebrew scholars and the dictionaries that I read, has a lot more to do with other things than might have to do with actual clapping. The word is used in Judges chapter 3 verse 21 when Eglon, the, I'm sorry, when Ehud, the judge, takes his left hand to his right thigh, pulls out a dagger, and thrusts it into Eglon's belly so that the fat closes over the hilt of the dagger. He thrusts it in, and that's the word that is used for clap here in Psalm 47. It's the same word that is used in Judges chapter 4, verse 21, when Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, sneaks up to sleeping Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, in her tent, takes a tent peg and drives it into his temple. That's the word. It's the word that is used when Ehud comes out of the mountains to the mountains of Ephraim and blows the trumpet to call people to him. It's the word that Gideon, is the word that is used of Gideon when he blows the trumpet in Judges 6 verse 34 and calls the Abiezrites to him. It is the word that is used when Absalom has three spears thrust through his heart by Joab in 2 Samuel chapter 18 verse 13. It is something that then is forceful. It is even used of the trumpet blowing in judgment against the children of Israel in several passages that are listed in your book. It is used of striking hands in a pledge in Proverbs 17, verse 26, I believe. One who is devoid of understanding strikes hand in a ple his pledge and becomes surety for his friend. Or Proverbs 22, verse 26. Do not strike hands in a pledge lest you become a surety for debt. And so it's something that is sudden, or maybe it's premeditated, but it's thrusting. We might think of it in comparison to an immediate and spontaneous high five after a touchdown, a thrilled cheer at a football game that pumps a fist in the air. We might think of it as something along those lines that simply shows a spontaneous rejoicing. It is not authorizing a clapping in hands during the worship service because this Old Testament, well, even if it did, in the New Testament we don't have that authorized. So we're not even talking about the same sort of thing. We're not even on the same animal here. We're talking about a specific sound of rejoicing when you realize you've won the victory. Dan Kessinger and I were in an open forum at a place one time where a lot of people had not been introduced to Christianity very much just yet. One particular person had and was still finding the thrill in the resurrection the way that we all ought to find the thrill in the resurrection, I suppose. 
Somebody was asking about the grave. Somebody was asking about the veneration. Somebody said that there was no veneration at the tomb of Christ. Dan pointed out very simply what you all know. There's no veneration at the tomb of Christ because there was no body in the tomb. At which point this young man pulled, clenched his fist, pulled his elbow into his ribs and said, Yes! That's the joy. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Reasons for this rejoicing? Verse 2, For the Lord Most High is awesome. I believe the King James says terrible. The idea is reverence. I think the word awesome better translates our modern English idea of what this Hebrew word would mean. It's something that inspires awe to us. Let's illustrate with biblical places. When Jacob sees angels ascending and descending on the ladder when he puts his head on a stone, he says, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Genesis 28, verse 17. God is to be feared among all gods. Exodus 15, verse 11. When God says to the children of Israel, I will make a covenant with you, and I will protect you, and I will do many mighty works in you, He says at the end of Exodus 34, verse 10, this is an awesome thing that I will do with you. It was, wasn't it? When the psalmist, or when Elihu writes in Job 37, verse 22, with God is awesome majesty. I imagine Ezekiel would understand a passage like that when he saw a vision of God on his throne above a sea of crystal glass and everything's on fire and there's emerald glow radiating out of everything. There are four living creatures going back and forth on torches with, on fire and they glow and they go so fast and they go straight forward and they go backward. He sees all that and he falls down fearful. With God is awesome majesty. Psalm 66, verse 3. Say to God, how awesome are your works. This, uh, through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. Psalm 66, verse 5. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in His doing toward the sons of men. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the people of Moab and Ammon, a little bit later in history, are referenced when the prophet says, This they shall have for their pride, because they may reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them. He will reduce to nothing the gods of the earth. All the peoples of the earth shall worship Him, each from His place, indeed from from the shores of the nations. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, when Moses is giving the speech for the children of Israel to enter into the land of Canaan after they failed the first time, after 40 years wandering in the wilderness, he's reminding them about how God will be good to them and have help them overcome all of their enemies. He says, You shall not be terrified of them, that is your enemies, you shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. It hearkens to the New Testament idea that reminds us that if we fear God in His awe enough, we just might not be afraid of anything else. Do not fear those who can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. What can they do to you? They can send you on to be with your God. Well, that's what you're after anyway. Do not fear those who can do that, but fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Or fear those, fear him who, after he has destroyed the body, is able to cast the soul into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Why rejoice? Why clap your hands? Why shout to the God with a voice of triumph? Well, the Lord is awesome. That's plenty enough. Secondly, the Lord is the great King over all the earth. The last part of verse 2 says, He reigns on high. In Jeremiah chapter 27 and verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, for him to say to the people, I have made the earth. Now, I've been to a lot of people's houses who are really good at woodworking, and I know nothing about it. But they show me some things that they've made, and they're, they're very proud of it, and they ought to be very proud of it because they've done well, they've worked hard. Here's God who says, I have made the earth. The man and the beast that are on the ground... And I have formed it with my great power and my outstretched hand, and I have given it to whomever seemed proper to me. 
Oh yeah, isn't that the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned when he went like an animal for seven years in Daniel chapter 4? That the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever He will, and sets over it the lowest of men? Nebuchadnezzar learned, I'm nothing. I thought I was something great. I'm nothing. I was warned about this. I still got prideful. I'm nothing because God gives this to whomever He will. As Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2 verse 21, He changes the times and the seasons. He raises up kings. He removes kings. He'll put in office whoever He wants to put in office. In Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 7 through 10, God then said some of that office putting, some of that keeping of the nations depends upon the people's humility toward Him. He's not just speaking about Judah. He's speaking about any nation when He says, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, then I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. But the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent of the good with which I had thought to benefit it. God moves and shakes kingdoms. We thought it was elections. And yes, I think elections are important and I need to vote Christian morals and conscience in those elections as much as is possible. But I need to pray harder than I vote because God moves the kingdoms. God does what He wants to do in the kingdoms of men. In Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 12, God said, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my wrath, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. <laughs> you ever have a hammer in your hand? What's that hammer going to do? Exactly what you want. Well, most of the time your thumbnails might testify otherwise. Most of the time your hammer is going to do exactly what you want it to do. But when you're God, the rod in your hand, the staff in your hand, is going to do exactly what you want it to do. Assyria, King Sennacherib, King whoever you are at the time, you're going to do exactly what I want you to do. Wait a minute, God. How do we have free will then? God, don't you think God who created the earth and resurrected Christ from the dead is powerful enough to allow free will but know what's going to happen and work it toward his ends anyway woe to Assyria the rod of my wrath and the staff in whose end is my indignation I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath to seize the spoil to take the prey to tread them down like the mire of the streets yet he does not think so nor it is in his heart to do so but it is in his heart to destroy and not a few nations the king of Assyria thinks I'm just going to go beat these people up and show how wonderful I am. But God says, I'm just using you. He's using His free will, but God's using His free will too. And then, in verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 10, it says that after God has performed all His works on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, that He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria for the glory of his haughty looks. I'll raise up this kingdom to take down that kingdom. And when that kingdom gets proud, I'll raise up somebody else to take him down. Same thing that was said in Jeremiah 25 and 27. God said, I've given this to Nebuchadnezzar right now. Everybody's going to serve Nebuchadnezzar right now. But in a little bit, he's going to, after his son and his grandson reign, then everybody's going to, he's going to have to go serve somebody else because he's going to get too proud. The Lord is the king over all the earth. Jesus to Pilate, the governor of Judea, and the world of the Roman Empire, you would have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. He will subdue the peoples under us, verse 3, and the nations under our feet. You know what under the feet means. In Joshua chapter 10, the Amorite kings were brought to Joshua. He called the captains of his army and said, put your feet on their necks. Seemed unnecessary because the next thing he's going to do is kill them. But he wanted a ceremonial observance of the fact that these men had been defeated. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of hands. You have put all things under his feet. Man has dominion over the earth. Don't tell Peter, but we're allowed to eat animals. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. Why? Verse 27. For he has put all things under his feet. That is under Christ's feet. He has subdued the nations under us. He has put all the kingdoms, all the nations under our feet. Verse 4, He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob whom He loves. God had promised that He would deal with nations. 
There was one exception to God dealing with nations, just wiping them out when they became evil. And when these nations became evil, remember God saying to Abraham, you can't have the land of Canaan just yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete. When a nation's evil gets complete, God wipes them out. Seems to me to be the course of history and as revealed in the Old Testament. I don't know how that works in every secular observance that we have, but it seems to me that there's something behind the scenes that can be applied to that in the providence of God. When the sin accumulates to a particular level, one fellow I know has a theory that when the sin accumulates to the point that you're killing babies all the time, that God's just about done with you. But there was an exception in the Old Testament era. No matter how wicked Israel and Judah got, God would protect them. For his own namesake, because he'd promised to protect them. And for his servant David's sake, 2 Kings 19 verse 34, because God had promised to David that there would always be somebody from the tribe of Judah on the throne. Now God had set apart the nation of Israel for the specific purpose, it seems to me, of bringing Christ into the world. You cannot argue that Christ just had some delusions in Nazareth and decided, hey, I'll be a religious leader, and popped up and wrote some book and people followed him, because you can trace his genealogy all the way back to Abraham and then all the way back to Adam, and there were all kinds of prophecies in the revelations to Abraham and to Moses and the people and the prophets thereafter that had to do with Jesus Christ. And what if God had got upset with the idolatry of Judah and just wipe them out, well, we wouldn't be sitting here today because Christ would have never come and we'd have no hope and we'd be living in our sins and we'd be miserable in them and then we'd die and go to hell. So God has chosen our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. God said in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11, For I am with you to save you. Though I make a complete end of all, no, though I make a full end of all the nations that are around you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice and not let you to go altogether unpunished. In, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 7 through 9, God said, I have raised my hand in an oath that the nations who surround you shall bear their own shame. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit. Isn't it lovely imagery? To my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you will be tilled and sown. God is not going to let Judah die. He loves Jacob. Abraham had a boy named Isaac after Abraham was called out of his country, had a boy named Isaac. Isaac had a boy named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons that became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. God's not going to let them go. He's going to bring the Christ through them. That's the shout of triumph. And that's the reason we shout. The sound of the trumpet is next. In verse 5, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Now the trumpet was used in all sorts of different situations in the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 10, there were two silver trumpets that were formed and they were to be used for a variety of purposes, one of, them, one of which was once when the people went to war. Verse 9, when you go to war in your land with the enemies who oppress you, then you shall sound the alarm with the trumpets and the Lord will remember you and you will be saved from your enemies. Sound the alarm with the trumpets. Get everybody together. A trumpet generally can be heard. I'm certainly glad that God did not cause us to be called with a harp because it can't be heard in the orchestra unless you listen really, really closely. But he called us to be sound with the sound of a trumpet. Ehud, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, Ehud and Gideon used the trumpet to call people together to him. In Joshua, the trumpet was used to tear down the walls of Jericho, to at least have the priests blowing seven trumpets of ram horns, ram's horns while the people shouted, and then the walls came down by God's power. The trumpet was used throughout all of Israel for many different purposes. Joab even used the trumpet twice to stop Israel from, to stop Judah from 
pursuing Israel in the days of Ishbosheth, and then in later in the days of Absalom. And when Absalom was first setting himself up to usurp the authority and be the king, he sent spies throughout all the land of Israel, saying, When you hear the sound of the trumpet, then rise up and say, Long live King Absalom. Absalom reigns in Hebron, or something along those lines. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. And then when a legitimate king was being appointed, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 34, David said, Take Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, and anoint him king, and blow the trumpet, and say, Long lives King Solomon. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And the final day when Jesus comes back to get his kingdom and take it to heaven, it's no mystery. Or it is mystery until Paul explained it. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. The loudest verse in the Bible is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive in Christ will meet them in the air to ever be with the Lord. God has gone up with the shout, the shout of the trumpet. God's doing the fighting in this battle in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, as He did on so many other occasions. God's doing the battle. What's left for the people then? Verses 6 and 7. Sing praises to our God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. You know that in the Old Testament, singing was an important part of the musical worship to God. You know that in the New Testament, that's what we have authorized. Sing and make melody in your heart. Teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You realize that you're supposed to sing with understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. You know that when you're suffering, you should pray. And when you're cheerful, you should sing psalms. Well, these people had sort of a balance. I don't know that James 5, verse 13 is saying you can't sing when you're down or when you're troubled. He's just saying this is a general mood of things. When you're down, you pray. When you're up, you sing. Because any in any way, you're going to be praising God. Well, these people came to the valley. Remember what he said to them? Remember what Jehaziel said to them? You will not need to fight in this battle, but stand still. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And as they began to sing, as they began to praise the beauty of holiness, as they began to sing, God set the battle on stage in front of them so they could watch their enemies die in front of them as they began to sing. Remember 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15 where Jehoshaphat said, Oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power at all against this great multitude that has come against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. My wife gets angry at me sometimes. I'll be sitting there looking at my phone. She says, What are you doing? I'm reading the news. Stop it. She becomes upset because I'm going to be depressed after I read the news. Because I'll read of the MS-13 gangs and I'll read of the stadiums in Syria that were changed to death chambers where the people watched thousands of Christians be beheaded. And I'll read of the abortions that are still going on. And we never mention in our prayers, but shouldn't, you know, we pray for the military, we pray for everybody else. Shouldn't we pray in our prayers publicly every once in a while for God to end the Holocaust? And I see that the people on the so-called tolerant left are really the totalitarian left, and they want us to agree with them or die. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I believe once they have the power to put us to death, they will. They're already putting the babies to death that they don't want. And I fear some of the people that I love at the same time. I love the individuals, but I fear the agendas that are behind them. And I used to think, well, we could do something good about this. We could, we could make a change, and we, we'll fight this. We'll, we'll fight this. Somebody in chapel a while back got real upset because everybody was focused on a particular sin. He said, why are we singling out that sin? Why don't we talk about violence? Why don't we talk about this? And I said, we did that. We've been there and fought that battle and lost. I remember the 70s when the campaigns came out against violence on TV. We boycotted, we fought, we lost. And when the campaigns came about, out about too much sex on TV, we boycotted and we fought and we lost. I remember in the 90s getting the loan reports from the American Family Association that the media was biased in their coverage of the pro-life rallies on January 22nd, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And you tried to convince people of that and they said, ah, about the economy. And I remember as we fought every step of the way, all the immorality, and now it's a flood. 
and we don't know what to do. So we sing. We sing because God is sovereign. We pray because He's powerful. We worship because He's wonderful. We adore Him because He is awesome. There's always something to do. Maybe I missed it in all those fights. Worship. Yeah, speak out. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians 5 verse 11. But first and foremost, worship. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For God is the great King over all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. I know, I understand, that my singing of a song will not bring down an ISIS army. I know that my singing of a song will not bring down a movement that is designed to quench free speech. I know that my singing will not do that, but I know that my singing will be heard in the voice of God, and I know God can do those things. Whether He chooses to or not, I still sing. I still pray. I still worship because my hope is not on this earth where the trouble is. My hope is somewhere beyond. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. Verse 9, the princes of the people have gathered together. People argue over whether that's the princes of Judah that have gathered together or the princes of the other nations that have finally gathered together under God's purveyance. Well, it doesn't matter because it's all going to happen. Psalm 72, verse 11, Yes, all the kings of the earth shall fall down before Him, it says of the Messiah. All nations shall serve Him. Revelation 21, 24 of that great city, the new Jerusalem. All kings shall bring their glory and honor into it. All five living presidents that we have right Right now are going to bow down before Jesus Christ someday. All Saddam Husseins and all Kim Jong-uns and all Hitlers are going to bow down before Jesus Christ. It's all going to happen. And all the supposed glory that fades overnight from a kingdom is going to be brought into the glory of the new Jerusalem because God reigns over the nations. The princes of the people have gathered together the people of the God of Abraham. The people of the God of Abraham had that working for them back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now let's spell that out. Some of you know it, and I want to just go through it real quickly. Some of it's already been mentioned in this lectureship. God promised to Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 22, after those ups and downs of faith when he was tested, and he finally had the willingness to sacrifice his only son Isaac for the cause that God said to do, God said, since I, you have obeyed my voice, through your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now you fast forward through all the biblical prophecies. At least stop at Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, where in Nebuchadnezzar's dream a stone is cut out of a mountain without hands, divine origin, thrust against a statue that everybody secularly was worshiping, breaks in pieces and consumes that statue. And the meaning is given in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. In the days of these kings, there was gold, bronze, silver, or gold, silver, bronze, and, and iron. And in the days of these kings, that is the kings of that fourth kingdom, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and then the Roman. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and it will not be left to other people people. And it will uh, break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. Well, don't you know that in the days of the Roman kingdom an angel came and said in Luke chapter 1 verses 32 and 33 that he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and he will be given the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob and of his kingdom there will be no end. And don't you know that in the days of the Roman kingdom Jesus stood before an audience and said, assuredly some of you who are standing here will not taste death till the kingdom of God has come with power. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Don't you know that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 verses 18 and 19 in Caesarea Philippi to questioning disciples that his, He would build His church and He would give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Oh yeah, He's equating the church and the kingdom at that particular time. And don't you know that when the kingdom would be established it would be with power. Luke chapter 24 verse 49 after His resurrection before His ascension Jesus said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In Acts 
Acts chapter 1, he identified the power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came on the apostles. They spoke with other languages. People said, what's going on here? Peter explained in his sermon that the Christ had been resurrected from the dead, that he had ascended to the throne of the Father, that he was reigning in his kingdom as Lord and Christ, and that he had poured out this which they saw and heard. And they wondered, what in the world should we do? Because seven weeks ago we were calling for his crucifixion. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Three thousand of them did. The church was begun that day. The kingdom was begun that day. Paul said that he was in the kingdom, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. So it had to exist in the days of the Roman kingdom, just like that prophecy. And how did you get in the Roman kingdom? You weren't born in the Roman kingdom, or get in Christ's kingdom, rather. You weren't born into Christ's kingdom. No, you were born again into Christ's kingdom. Nicodemus, probably proud of his Jewish birth, came to Jesus and, and said, you're a great man. Jesus said, you've got to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And what happens when you go down into the waters of baptism and you leave your old man of sin behind and you're raised to walk in newness of life, you're born again. And what else happens? Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ to put on Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, the people of Abraham's God. God is not so concerned about Israel as a nation today, though He's concerned about every individual living in freedom and righteousness, I'm sure. But He's concerned about His kingdom, the church, the spiritual Israel where Christ has reigned from A.D. 30 and where He'll reign until He gives the kingdom to God the Father in the last day, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. And what we need to know is this. We're overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. So what should we do? We sing. Because God is sovereign. We praise because God is powerful. We worship because God is wonderful and we adore Him because He is awesome. And the shields of the earth belong to our God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to pulling down strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. We put on the whole spiritual armor of God. Christ's kingdom is not physical, but spiritual, he said in John 18, verse 36, or else my servants will be fighting. I'm not here to fight a physical battle. That's the government's job, Romans chapter 13, verse 4. I'm here to try to persuade people with the terror of the Lord. I'm here to try to persuade people to follow the Lord. And if the people come against me with hatred and bigotry and violence and they want to kill me, then here's what I'm supposed to do anyway. Take it, die, and go be with with my Lord. And then I'll get to sing to Him forever. We don't know what to do? Sing. Because God is sovereign. Would you sing this song please again? God reigns over the